would be an event in any field, but especially technology, without technology challenges. I think this is a good metaphor for the world that we're living in. Um, I think we're uh, live. I want to thank you uh, so much for uh, being with us and uh, the online uh, guests. I'm really sorry for uh, taking a bit of time to catch up, but uh, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of you that are here present and the ones that are watching us uh, online. Um, we're here in the Romanian parliament where uh, these days uh, a special event takes place and it doesn't really take place that often. So once every four years we have the ITU um, event taking place and we're very honored to host this, to have hosted almost this um, in, in Romania. I want to thank um, in particular Ancom and, and UiPath for making this event uh, possible. Um, I know it's, it's sometimes difficult um, when you have such a humongous event uh, going on around you to uh, also focus on, on some of the things that the civil society and the private uh, institutions are trying to do and uh, let us uh, extend our gratitude to, to Wana and her team from, from Ancom for, for making this, this happen. My name is Ciprian Sanesco. I'm president and CEO of Social Innovation Solutions. Um, and I'm very happy and excited to welcome you all to uh, this, this uh, I'll say, special event. Uh, automation for good, leveraging uh, automation to drive SDGs or sustainable development goals. Um, it sounds easy and it's not. But in the same time, uh, because it's not easy, uh, that means that uh, it's most likely very important. So I'm very happy to uh, have with us a series of speakers today that will show us not just how important it is and not necessarily if it's easy or not, but um, how can we actually bring more technology uh, to uh, the world of uh, development in the end. We have a great lineup of speakers, and I think you can uh, see them um, on the on the slide attached and in the presentation as well. Uh, we're very uh, honored to have uh, later on with us Sabine Sarmash, who's a member of the Romanian Parliament and then chairman of uh, ITU uh, PP, and uh, Dr. Reinhard Scholl, he's deputy director of the ITUT Secretariat, and we're very happy to have him as well. You will see him later. Um, wearing uh, uh, also a very nice t-shirt that I encourage you, if you're here, to also try and buy it. Um, uh, I'm very excited not just to uh, have these amazing speakers alongside with us today, but also to present some um, findings and some initial findings from a, a report, um, from our latest trends report on, um, on uh, how automation and AI can be um, a driver for SDGs in the end. This is a report um, designed by Solutions, our foresight company, with the support of, um, of UiPath, um, a leading software company at, at global level. Um, and just a bit about automation for good. Um, let's take about six to seven minutes to briefly go, go to some of the many, many use cases uh, and trends that we have uncovered. They're a, a great source of inspiration to us all. Um, and uh, of course, uh, inspiration um, also needs action uh, to um, be uh, even more meaningful. Um, a bit about uh, how the report looks um, and um, what we have in it, as you might see on the screen, uh, both behind me and online. And I want to say hello to the many people that are joining us already uh, online. We do talk in the report about what Automation for Good is, but also a series of, of use cases um, related to how we can have better homes, uh, food, energy, health, and education, and how technologies like automation and artificial intelligence. And I salute uh, the progress that was made in the ITU um, uh, these days on, on AI at global level. Uh, we also talk uh, a lot about how automation for good relates to the business community with some um, examples from around the world on how we better work, uh, how can we manufacture um, in a more sustainable way, or how can we actually create sustainable uh, finance. And last but definitely uh, not least, um, and I think it's, um, um, it's great that we are in a public um, office in Romania, the Romanian parliament, we talk about better governments, but also how automation and artificial intelligence can actually support NGOs in fostering their work. And we're very excited to also have um, some representatives of uh, global NGOs joining us today, physically or digitally. This is a hybrid event, but I would dare to call it a digital event. Uh, we are both uh, here 
physically, but also we are both um, digitally uh, present. Um, there's also, uh, instead of conclusions, or uh, if you like, at the end, we have uh, gathered 10 trends on how we see uh, automation um, in the future. A bit about, uh, as you can see on the screen, how we relate and what is uh, automation in the end for good. Uh, and um, I think in the end, it's about people and how they are, as you can see, they're enablers, but also beneficiaries. I think uh, this is, and technology in itself, um, without uh, understanding it and using it is uh, to some extent um, uh, without use. So it's it's a, not just a technology, but it is a technology for the people and designed uh, by the people. Uh, and in the same time, uh, it is a great opportunity to create new skills. Uh, we have been hearing many debates um, in the ITU sessions about the future of work and how technology and digitalization play a huge role in this. So I think, um, um, uh, it's about reskilling, but also um, skilling, um, even if you're uh, 38, like I am these days. Um, the chapter uh, or, or the, the report, and you can, um, if you are here present with us offline, uh, you can uh, uh, use the QR code to actually download and read the, the full uh, 48 pages. Um, focuses on, on three parts. The first one is related to communities, and we do an analysis of what is the impact of, of automation on, on better food, homes, uh, healthcare, and, and education. Uh, just a couple of examples uh, so that you see some of the use cases uh, you see and you use them as inspiration and perhaps take them into action, as mentioned before. Uh, we have a, a, a case from, uh, from Denmark um, where a series of flats were equipped, uh, equipped with the NPCs, with the model predictive control systems that uh, have uh, helped them to uh, go for uh, 10 to 30% savings. Uh, you can find significantly more details in the report on this. Um, if we go to Colombia, and um, I have uh, seen some of the Colombian delegation earlier on, um, uh, there's uh, uh, an, an increase in the way um, uh, smart cities can act. Uh, there's a, an, an immediate output on this where em emergency response times have improved by 40% in a rather large city like, like Bogota. Um, and in the end, uh, as, uh, as uh, food um, and climate are on everyone's mind uh, these days, um, uh, we have uh, obviously discovered that uh, RPA is uh, highly uh, relevant. For um, um, agriculture, for example, there's a lot of examples that you can see on the table. I'm not going to go too much into, into them, um, but some uh, specific use cases that we find relevant, for example, Blue River um, uh, is, is a, a great example on how um, automation uh, and not only can support a growing sustainable vegetables, um, especially in the harsh conditions that we are experiencing and will continue to experience due to climate change um, now and in the future. Uh, of course, if we look at energy, and uh, I'm very happy to, to be joined later on by um, uh, experts also in, in this field. Um, there's a lot related to wind turbines uh, as an example, uh, but even a more specific example from Kefir, um, where um, uh, invoicing by uh, using RPA, uh, we have been able, or they have been able to, to lower uh, the time that was used by humans um, and to um, invest that time in, 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 in other uh, types of activities. Um, of course, automation uh, for good is, is highly relevant for the business community. Uh, one key takeaway, there's many others in the report. As I was telling you, you can download it if you want uh, by uh, scanning the QR code uh, on the papers in front of you. Um, a, a large part of it is related to traceability of information, reporting, and automating all these processes that are highly uh, important in the way we measure, but also act as companies uh, uh, in the world. A couple of very uh, fast examples from the um, special world of manufacturing and circular economy. This is a solution from Sweden. Um, you can see more details there. I, uh, if you uh, are interested in these topics, I strongly suggest you, you go and, and find more info about refined uh, technologies. In the same time, we do need to talk about how do we finance uh, all the solutions that we 
uh, are inspired by or put in practice. Uh, there's one example from um, from uh, Ikano Bank, for example, um, uh, talking about how um, automation can support not just the uh, beneficiaries, but also the company um, in itself. Um, and uh, last but not least, definitely what we call formal communities, be it NGOs or the public system. Um, the, the report focuses significantly on, on use cases and also uh, various observations that we've had over the years um, about how uh, these technologies can support the public system. We will have the opportunity to hear more in the coming uh, minutes on this. Just a short example from the UK, for example, the UK Department of Work and Pensions uh, was able to, to clear a backlog of 30,000 claims in less than two weeks. That would have been completely impossible uh, without this technology. Uh, and last but not least, one of my favorite organizations in the world, after the ITU, of course, is, is NASA. Um, they have been using uh, for a number of years um, RPA and other types of, of, uh, of course, technologies in automation and AI to actually win time. And if we can win time, I think we can win the future. Um, I don't have a lot of time left, uh, so I cannot win time. What I can tell you is that you can find the rest of the four trends uh, in the report, uh, just a short uh, mention on, on some of them. Um, uh, as I was telling you about traceability, this is a, a significant trend that, that we see in the next um, in the next years. Um, another one is the career booster. We really believe automation is a career booster, not a career destroyer. Uh, and we see this uh, happening uh, around the world and even in our home country. Um, of, of Romania and across Central and Eastern Europe. And one more that um, I would put uh, on the table is cybersecurity or security of automation, which is critical uh, for the next years when both um, automation and artificial intelligence are uh, stepping up the game. Uh, and so do other types of actors, uh, national or non-national, that would like to benefit from the weaknesses that we might uh, also have. Now, those are very short, they're very fast because also we need to win time. And I want to start by uh, inviting um, our uh, first speaker in the end, um, Mr. Sabin Sarmash to the table. He's a member of the Romanian uh, parliament uh, and he's chairman of this uh, amazing um, um, event that took place uh, for, it seems like a lifetime here. Uh, welcome. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time, but the question is not if we have enough time, but what we do with it. Uh, so congrats on the very, very uh, outstanding work you've done personally and, and in your capacity with all the team that was around this uh, special event. It was an honor, I think, for us as a country to host this, this uh, event. Um, and uh, in the end, uh, I think it's, it's all um, um, in the hearts and minds of the people that were around here. Um, uh, you know, but in the end, the question is, how do we build a sustainable uh, future um, through technology? So, uh, Sabine Sarmash, you have the floor. Thank you, Ciprian. A pleasure to see you again. Uh, we met early when I came on Bucharest, I think, after three months or something like that. And from, from then, we, we see each other pretty often in conference like this. Thank you for inviting me. Congratulations to UiPath for this, for choosing to have the side event uh, at the Plenipot conference. Uh, indeed, it's a huge conference for Romania. It's an opportunity we never had before. Uh, it's an event that will last in the memories of Romanian people, but not only, at least in the memory of more than 3,500 people that attended this event, not all of them at the same time, but in the last, uh, last three weeks. Uh, I'm trying to shift my 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 uh, my thoughts right now because I'm coming from some strong negotiation among the member states who are trying to achieve sustainability through technology because it's a lot about on this conference being as you can imagine a United Nations organization most of the work done on, uh, at ITU level it's strongly related to SDGs of United Nations which which is which is normal how do we achieve this this is a question that most of the leaders of organization, no matter if we are talking about private sector or public sector, uh, is having in the last, especially in the last uh, years. And uh, studies are, are proving that uh, leaders of the organizations uh, have specific goals, clear goals for the next three years related with sustainability. 
I think that uh, we never had before such an era when people from all around the world uh, are having in, this, uh, in, in their mind this question, how are we becoming more and more sustainable? And some of the solutions are, are the ones you, you presented in your report, or at, at least, and there, I would like to uh, tackle two, two topics. One is IoTs and the other one is artificial intelligence, because it's related to what happened in the last two weeks here at the, at the conference. Uh, IoT is helping a lot uh, cities to become more and more sustainable. We can see IoT involved in uh, achieving uh, less energy consumption, in uh, having less pollution in the, in the countries, in, in uh, cities, in making uh, cities sustainable and being able to have to face the challenge of having uh, an increased number of, of people and uh, great number, a huge number of population in their cities. And um, this this solution, the, this uh, the way of, of solving this problem, it's uh, most and most re relies on uh, 5G networks and IoT, especially. One of the resolution that was adopted this uh, week uh, by ITU, it's uh, focused on IoT and it's encouraging the use of IoT worldwide, with uh, the benefit of achieving verticals in different industries to to, to increase the quality of the life of the people and to increase the sustainability of the of the cities uh, the other topic ai uh, and i have to say uh, about this that for the first time I, i'm going to give a quote from all, one of the vice chairs for the first time in the history itu has a resolution on uh, artificial intelligence uh, it was an attempt at the last plenipot four years ago but uh, it wasn't successful this time we we made history here in romania and we managed to have an i uh, we managed to have an ai AI uh, uh, resolution, which is also also encouraging uh, the governments and the private and public sector to use AI in in favor of uh, a better life and a sustainable future. So, as I said at the beginning, I think we are in, in a historical point uh, where sustainability it's on agenda of, of both public and uh, private sector, and we are achieving this with multiple uh, tools. Um, and I, I try to give these two examples, which are strongly related to what happened here in Romania in the last uh, last two and a half weeks. Lovely. Um, I don't know, don't have a lot of time. Uh, now we're winning time, but how much time would we have left? About or we, we can stay. We can stay ten more minutes if it's needed. Uh, Lovely. Um, my colleagues are waiting for for another negotiations, but I. Uh, so I lost speaking time. of of the of the resolution. Um, how how should businesses look at this resolution and what is your take on on the result we do have a resolution but it also matters what we have in it i think it's important to say that these resolutions are not mandatory for the countries they are kind of guidelines but uh once you have a, such a guideline implemented and these guidelines are are, are are helping in two ways one of them is to uh help the organ the union to to work in the next few, four years, and on the other on the other hand, are acting like guidelines for the countries uh, itself. Uh, as a business, I would look at the trends because a resolution it's it's uh, in the end something that it's agreed by maybe 193 countries at the world level, and this is a proof that the future is going in that directions, and that you as a business can build your strategy as a company. Uh, align with the views from from such a resolution so it, it, it's a proof that there is a wide consensus at the worldwide level and you you have to, you have to look and to to think uh about those uh those uh let's say uh, things that were were uh, approved by the older countries when building your strategy and when when you are building your plans for the next next years how would a a resolution or if you look at four years from now what are the resolutions that you're expecting what are the new technologies or the old technologies you do you think need uh, such a strong message but in the end it's not mandatory but it is a strong message and not just to countries and governments but to business sectors and youth that would like to you know uh, move forward in their career in uh, many other technologies yeah there is always a strong debate in it when what about emerging technologies and uh it's i think this is normal because we have six different regions with different views uh 
uh, and it's normal to have uh, I don't know different approaches and support or not support for for the, for a topic or another topic. Um, it's difficult to say what is going to be new. Probably we'll have proposal to update resolutions like AI, IoT, and cybersecurity in, in the future as well. And I'm sure of that that at the next plenty pot will will have on the table some updates of, of this resolution because the technology is evolving. So we have to update the resolutions as well. But uh, I think ITU in the future will won't be able to avoid other uh, other topics because we have experts group that are are working on almost any technology, uh, any emerging technology. Probably we, we can have in the future. Who knows? A resolution on uh, block on blockchain or uh, or uh, similar technology or on quantum computing. We can uh, quantum communications because. I think they cannot avoid such a, a or at least so, to tackle those topics. Even if it's not a clear resolution for, for a topic like uh, quantum communications, probably there's going to be more room for such a subject in, in the in the future resolution. And this is normal because IT probably is going to be one is going to become more and more relevant in the future. And they, they need to to adapt to the challenges. It has IT has a clear mandate. IT is not doing anything related to technology. Its main focus is on ICTs. And uh, there is a strong debate if it has to expand or not, uh, or not the mandate. Probably there are going to be countries which are going to say, okay, you, we need to do more. There are going to be some other countries that are going to say, okay, we, we need just to do what we are doing and we are doing very well. But for sure, there will be, there is going to be some debate around such subjects. I, I can only imagine the negotiations that took take place took place and will take place in, in the next uh, days and, and, and years, of course. Um, there's a question, and there's a lot of people in the room, um, and I've already got a question uh, on, on my WhatsApp. By the way, if there's a question from the room, just please raise your hands, and I will come back to you uh, in one second, uh, because I have one uh, about challenges that you, you see governments having with adapting and using technologies. You've met with hundreds, almost, uh, of of governments, uh, government officials. Um, if you would to put three on the table that are shared by all. Yeah, uh, this is this is a very good question, and I, I think I never answered this way the way I'm going to answer right now because I have in, indeed fresh uh, experience. I had the chance to talk with the Secretary General of ITU, and uh, he visited more than 100, 130 countries all around the world. So it's a lot. Uh, but he was at the leadership of ITU for 24 years, so it had it had a lot of, of uh, opportunities to do so. And uh, I asked him uh, where the uh, digital transformation is performing very well uh, in relation with the authority of the government. And I ask if it's an authority for digitalization, if it's a minister for uh, digital transformation, if it's a minister for communication, and so if the this uh this uh let's say if this is under the minister of Inter internal affairs and so on and he told me it's always when it's under the prime minister at a higher level of authority so one challenge is the first one it's the assumption of digital transformation at the highest level possible if it's a president it's it's a dream but it's not possible because the president has other things to do it's a, if it is the level of prime minister and you can see what happened in estonia and some other countries it was fast because it was an uh, an uh, assumption of the highest level. So this is the first challenge, to convince the leadership that this is a priority and not just to declare, to act for this every day. The second, uh, the second challenge we have as, uh, as governments, as, uh, as public institutions, is the human resource. I mean, we need in the end to be fair with this. If we want to have, go through a digital transformation process, we need to bring the, the experts in and to pay accordingly them. Uh, we are acting very populist. I mean, you here with, with the politicians. We we cannot say uh, honestly that there is a lack of human resource of capacity, and without that, there is no one in some in some of the public institutions. There is no one who is able, and probably you know from your experience, nobody able to talk with the industry because they don't have the knowledge. I mean, we we don't need team of experts of IT developers in public institution, but at least we need few of them paid uh, like like in the private sector to, to work for uh, for um, for the public institution for the digital transformation process and probably the third challenge is staying with a strategy I mean I think we, we, we have a strategy right now we have a plan we need 
and this comes with uh, with uh, the uh, with the capacity of institution, with the memory of the institution. We need to stay with the plan. We are changing ministers every six months. We are changing the president of the authorities every one year or something like that. We we don't have continuity. It's very difficult to go through such a process without having a memory of the institution and we, without having the same leaders or continuity, not maybe the same leaders, but continuity at the level of, of, uh, of the institution which are in charge of such a process. Well, don't, don't quit and go back uh, in your <laughs> case. Um, we have a question, but if you can make the question short and not a comment. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sabine, uh, and thank you very much for the excellent chairmanship of this IT planning board. My name is Daniel Spoyala. I work for the German Development Agency. Uh, and uh, many years ago, I was the Romanian representative to the IT also. So I know a little bit the system. So when we speak about AI and uh, ITU, um, I think the world is like expecting to have a place where consensus has, can be built, especially around issues like uh, ethical algorithms and around many actually dangers that the publics are seeing when they are looking to the AI uh, market. So how do you feel what the ITU should be done? Because on other issues such as internet governance, it did not succeed to be a place of such consensus. Um, and second question is what Thank do you, you think? Daniel. We will okay. take your question and I will actually ask you later on the question that you wanted to ask him. Thank you. It's it's clear question from somebody who engaged in the, in past uh, in the past with ITU. It's, and it is very difficult to to have consensus on such subjects. That's why it took more than four years because they started uh, before uh, 2018. Uh, and the solution, in the end, to be fair, is to have a general agreement, not without going to, into details, with without being very specific. That is just establishing few lines of actions few principles and from there any government can build on top of that otherwise trying to go into details and to achieve consensus between a region like i don't know africa who, who has specific goals and maybe citel which is america's uh, who has different uh, objectives is going to be an, is going to be an, uh, an infinite discussion that is not is not going to lead anywhere uh, having this approach of of seeing uh, searching for common ground if it, even if it's at a very high level and establishing few uh, few goals, few directions, it's a good approach. It's a start. Otherwise, we won't start. It's a good approach. And this is what is going to happen probably on some other uh, technologies, some other uh, emerging technologies, which are were too new to, be, to, to allow us to reach consensus at the global level. But I think IT is the best place, because you mentioned that, where you can have at least consensus, even if it's at a very high level. Well, on that note, um, if it's the best place, I would like you to go to the best place and continue the negotiations. I really want to thank you for taking the time to to you know, be here with us. Uh, and thanks thanks to, to our colleagues from, from Ancom and, and UFAT for, for this um, uh, event. Uh, let's give a big round of applause and then let's wish you all the luck. Thank you very much for having me here. So we, we continue, and apologies again for, for being late. We're trying to catch up as much as possible. Uh, we're going now to, to see uh, uh, and to hear a presentation on, on how can we unlock the human uh, potential uh, with technology to advance the SDGs. I'm very honored to, to welcome, and if you could, could join us, uh, that would be lovely, uh, Dr. Reinhard Scholl. Uh, he is Deputy Director, ITUT Secretariat, the Telecommunication Standardization Bureau. Uh, it's great to have uh, him uh, with us. Uh, and as I was telling you at the beginning, I think we need to also uh, focus on how AI uh, and looking at the T-shirt, how AI is also um, uh, a big step up for, for SDGs or um, as you were saying about the, the, um, the developments of, of ITU. Now, uh, this is the, the clicker, I think, um, up, down. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And thank you very much to, to Romania for hosting uh, the Plenty Potential Conference. This is just a mind boggling venue here. It's amazing. We're all amazed here to be in this uh, venue. Okay, so this is the title I was given. 
unlocking the human potential with technology to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and I didn't change the title. So this is my storyline. I'm going to talk or argue that technological change is happening faster and faster. Then I will argue that a big uh, factor is uh, artificial intelligence that's causing this change. And in my last part, I will give some thoughts of why people or I think that the society is not really well equipped to deal with uh, exponential change with this fast change. You know, just to <clears throat> remind everyone, these are the sustainable development goals. There are 17 of them, like no poverty, zero hunger, gender equality, and so on. And then there are about 170-ish uh, targets and 230-ish uh, indicators that are used to measure whether the sustainable development goals will have been achieved by 2030, because that's the goal. Technological change is happening faster and faster, and it's happening exponentially. So I'm going to give you four examples in the fields of computing, energy, biology, and manufacturing. I think we all know, I hope, uh, the uh, what's called Moore's Law, which says that the number of transistors on a chip is doubling every 18 months or every two years or so. And uh, this is a semi-logarithmic plot, and an exponential line looks like a straight line on such a plot. And uh, this is the cause, Moore's Law, why we all have supercomputers in our pockets, our smartphones. This is even more amazing. So this is the cost of deciphering a human genome which uh, when it was done first about 20 years ago, you know, it cost here, according to this charge, $100 million. And nowadays, the cost of deciphering my DNA or your DNA is a few hundred dollars and it's going to come down further. So, you know, it will be, it will be almost in pocket money to get uh, someone's uh, DNA, someone's human genome in the future. Exponential exists also in the renewable energy uh, industry. So you can pick either solar cells, you can also pick wind turbines, you can also pick uh, battery storage. If you look, uh, look at the data, there is exponential growth mm -hmm. all over the place. And also in manufacturing. So this here is a chart uh, that shows the uh, 3D printing market uh, forecast. Uh, 3D printing is a tiny market, yeah, but it's an exponential market. And, um, you know, we haven't seen the effects of these exponential, really, except for, for computing. But the effects of the examples that I mentioned in biology or in, uh, in energy or manufacturing, you know, we haven't really felt them yet. And we don't really know what this will be like. I'm moving to the second part, which is uh, arguing that AI is a driver in technological change. And just to recap, what are the big advances over the last 10 years in AI? So the first one was in computer vision. So computers today see better than human beings. So computer vision is a computer can distinguish between a cat and a dog and many other things. And so this uh, brought us uh, facial recognition and will probably bring us uh, automatic driving someday. The next big thing that was tackled is what's called natural language processing. So that's the idea that a machine is trying to understand human language. In case you're using a Google Translate, you know, that's become pretty good. You know, depending on language, it's not perfect, but it's really, I mean, I use it often and it's, I think it's excellent. Then uh, my colleagues with little children tell me that they talk to their chat box, you know, they have regular conversation with chat bots like Alexis or Siri. And, you know, they, these chat Chatbots are very good at uh, well, that, you know, at uh, interpreting or understanding a language and having conversations. And then perhaps you are familiar with uh, a product called GPT-3. Who is familiar with GPT-3? Has someone heard GPT-3 before? Yeah. So there are other tools uh, out there. 
and similar tools. So these are sort of word prediction machines. You give it a sentence or a paragraph, and then you ask the computer to fill out the rest. So what I did for my talk today is I gave uh, the computer a few paragraphs, and then I asked the computer to complete my speech, and I learned it by heart. So that's what I'm doing now. Which is so I was this is not correct. This was a joke, but I could have I could have tried it. And I think pretty soon we'll be using system like that. But the really big progress or really huge progress of AI has been made in the sciences. Has anyone heard of alpha fold or the protein folding problem? Who has heard of that? Okay. So the Protein folding problem is the following. So proteins are biomolecules and they do lots of good things in our bodies. And they consist of a linear sequence of uh, 20 different types of you know, Lego blocks. And these Lego blocks are called amino acids. And when you have them in a human cell, within a milliseconds, they fold up into a three-dimensional structure. And the amino acid sequence, this linear sequence, determines uniquely the three-dimensional structure of the protein. And why is it good to know the structure is because if you know the structure, then we think we can figure out the function of the protein. So that's the important thing. We want to figure out the function of the protein because the protein can do, in general, one thing really, really well. And the protein folding problem, that's a problem that uh, scientists have been working on for 50 years. If you want to get a structure, the 3D structure of a protein, it takes today about one PhD thesis, so one PhD student, if he or she is lucky, would be able to figure out the structure of uh, his or her favorite protein. So there are uh, experimental technologies like X-ray crystallography, which, which help do that. So what the company uh, DeepMind uh, has done, and their product is called, or their, their tool is called AlphaFold, they have been able to predict 3D structure of proteins pretty much as good as it's being done if you use uh, technologies like sex uh, uh, crystallography. And they have not only been able to do this for you know, some proteins, they have been able to do it for all the proteins in the human body, and there are about uh, 20,000 different types of uh, protein estimated. And not just that, they have done it for every known protein on the planet. This is just unbelievable. So there are currently 200 million proteins known, and the number is going up. Yeah, so it's not just humans, it's also animals, plants, and fungi. And not only that, they made all of those 3D structures available publicly for free. So tens of thousands of biologists are actually downloading this and trying and experimenting. And this is just, you know, this happened this year and, and last year. This is just so amazing what they did here. You know, I remember this is uh, this is worth like five Nobel prizes, I think. Yeah. So this is this is just unbelievably fantastic what they did. So the 20th century is often called like the century of physics. And it turns out, you know, that mathematics, for some reasons that we don't really understand, is just phenomenal in explaining physical phenomena. And, you know, but physics, you know, physics is very simple if you compare it with biology. Physics people, they can solve a system with one particle or two particles, you know, one planet or two planets, or maybe an infinite number of particles. But everything is between is horribly complicated for a physicist. So biology is much, much more complicated. You know, just try to model a human cell you know, to do this with uh, mathematics. And it doesn't, doesn't look uh, that this is promising. But as Steve Mind has shown, it could be that AI is actually the language for biology. So the uh, sustainable development goals, so AI and the technologies, or in particular in this case AI, can do a lot to help achieve the sustainable development goals, but it can also do, it can also inhibit the uh, completion of the sustainable development goals. So how is that possible? So one of the sustainable development call, uh, goals is called decent work. You know, we should all have good jobs, decent work. But if AI and robots take over our jobs, what are we supposed to be doing? So that would be one example where AI is actually inhibiting the completion of sustainable development goals and not helping to accomplish them. 
we do have in ITU a platform which we call AI for Good, and this is this is a T-shirt that goes along with it. So it's an event platform, it's a networking platform, it's um, a content platform. It's sort of like a TV channel, and we have pretty much every day we have a session that features one uh, particular topic on on artificial intelligence. Our uh, webinars are 60, 90 minutes, and they're, they're pretty pretty technical, but for the intelligent non-expert, I think they are they're also of interest. Okay, last part of my talk, where I will argue that you know society is not really well equipped to deal with exponential change. So you often hear that people say technology is neutral. Yeah, technology is uh, value-free. Somehow it's imposed to us uh, from the outside. It's sort of you know, outside, uh, outside humankind. But that's not correct. Technology is not neutral. So if you are into a classical musics, music, then you may perhaps know of a piano player called Yuya Wong. So this here is Yuya Wong. And she's pretty small, yeah? She's below 1 meter 60. She's maybe 1 meter 55-ish or so, I googled. And, you know, I was always wondering, how can she play pieces by Rachmaninoff, who is known to have a huge hand span, you know, like, uh, like 30 centimeters or so? And, you know, women in general also have a smaller hand span than men. And um, I think in particular, Yue Wong has a pretty small hand span. So how can she do that? So there is a Canadian composer who about 20 years ago, and the story goes like that, you know, he was practicing some Chopin ballad uh, for the thousandth time. You know, he happened to be, you know, he happened to be a man, but he had uh, also small, small hands. And then all of a sudden, once it hit him, you know, it's not my hand, which is too small. It's the keyboard, which is too large. So that's a completely new way of thinking. You know, I, I never had this idea. You know, I, people may think, you know, it's the fault of the woman, maybe, or for, for fault of the person to have small hands. But no, it's not your fault. It's just the keyboard is too big. So he designed a keyboard with a, small, uh, a smaller keyboard, and they said this was just amazingly transformative, yeah, because now we could concentrate on interpreting the piece. Um, it doesn't look like that this has taken uh, over the concert halls uh, of the world, but uh, this is just one example, and I'm going to uh, give you the, uh, the book title uh, where I, I took this example. It's called Invisible Women. Does anyone know of this book called Invisible Women? So it has lots of examples that demonstrates how uh, today, like the world is designed for men and not for women. Yeah, there is a lot of bias and it's not that, that, that men are necessarily evil. I didn't, didn't think of that. And there are many examples, you know, also in the health sector, the medication is good, you know, for uh, tested on, on white men, but not on, on women, not on black people, not on Asians. So, so that's one example why you know, technology is not new. Uh, next thing, humans are not wired to understand exponentials. Yeah, we are, are wired to understand linear phenomena, but uh, things that grow, you know, slowly start, then all of a sudden shoot up. We we don't really understand that. You know, we don't have an intuition for that. My favorite example is the following: Suppose you have a lake with one flower, and the flower reproduces overnight. So the next day you have two flowers, they reproduce, and the next day you have four flowers. Suppose the lake is full after 50 days. When is the lake half full? 49. Yeah, it's, that's amazing. I mean, it's hard to believe, yeah? I mean, it's, you know, I, I know it's correct, yeah, but it's still, it's, um, it's astonishing, I think, yeah, that this, is, that this is the right answer. And I think we, we're, we're not wired to that. A third problem is there is a gap between those who speak science and technology and uh, those uh, who speak humanities. Often politicians or policymakers are in the camp of the humanities or the social sciences and they don't understand very much of the uh, technologies and perhaps uh, the scientists and the technology people, maybe they don't also explain it well. And this gap is going to widen. I mean, if you look at the uh, 
plenipotentiary conference. You know, some some of the things that are being discussed here, I, mean, I would say a glacier moves faster than the discussions that are happening here at times. And uh, because of the technological uh, change that's uh, getting faster and faster, this, this gap is, uh, is going to widen, which, uh, which is a problem. And then on my last, uh, pretty much last slide, you all often hear uh, that people say, you know, it's up to us. We can shape where technology goes. You know, we can decide whether we uh, use a knife to cut the uh, piece of bread or whether we uh, use a knife to kill someone. The problem that I have with this sentence, we need to shape the technologies, is the word we. Yeah, who is we? Is it me? Yeah, I don't really think so. Is it you? Well, I'm not sure. Is it some whiz kid uh, in a garage that's designing the next killer application? Is it one of the super uh, companies uh, that, that dominate today's technology world? Maybe, yeah. I'm not sure about the word uh, we here. Okay, and in case you're interested in these kinds of topics, these are the two books that I would recommend you to read. One is called Invisible Women. It's really great. You can also look at the talk of her on, on YouTube or on, one, on our AI for Good uh, channel. And the other one is by Azim Azar. It's called The Exponential Age. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nogusol. I think it was... Uh... Uh, very useful for our next conversations and I think very inspirational to actually think more about science Thanks. more about science and technology uh, but also within the framework of uh, people in the end um, now um, thanking uh, Dr. Scholl again for his intervention we're going to slowly move to the first panel um, and um, we have a, a speaker that is online and uh, two speakers that are physically uh, here. As I was telling you, this is a digital event, uh, and digital events are to some extent the future, and to some extent the immediate past. Now, I'm very happy to to introduce um, here with us physically uh, Margareta Mochibabic. She's director, public affairs and social impact for UiPath, uh, and Corina Murafa. She's an energy uh, policy expert. Um, and online, we have with us uh, Denis Carpes, his co-founder of Just Dig It and a, uh, a serial social entrepreneur. Uh, I hope, Denis, you can hear us. Great to see you again. Crystal clear. Yeah, great, great to see you. So, yes, technology does seem to work uh, most of the times, if not always. Uh, we just uh, recently at, at Social Innovation Solutions ended uh, climate Change Summit, this is was one of the largest events uh, on climate solutions in Europe. We were happy to have a, almost a million people watching these um, conversations. And I think um, what we are going to do in the next uh, roughly, let's say, 30 to 40 minutes um, is on the same uh, logic of climate solutions, with a focus on technology, uh, nevertheless. Um, I'm, I would start with, uh, with a question that is not programmed. Um, but I actually wanted to ask Margareta, uh, you, you saw the presentation from, from Dr. Scholl earlier on, and it was a lot to do also with how people understand technology and their relation with technology. So if you have an immediate reaction to that, and then we move to Corina and, and, and Dennis, of course. Thank you very much, and absolutely love the presentation. I think it was very inspiring. Uh, I also took some photos, so... Uh... Thank you so much for, for that. Uh, my immediate thought was that we need to be intentional about what we want to achieve, because if technology is not neutral, um, then we need to make sure that it is designed for good. So in this, in this context, I think it's becoming increasingly important to have automation for good and technology for good in general. And then we need to decide who is we, right? Uh, and come up with a definition for what good is and thank God for the UN SDGs. Uh, <laughs> but essentially that was my, my key thought that we need to be very intentional about what we want to achieve. Yeah, um, so I'm gonna go to, to uh, Corina slowly. Um, uh, we heard, I mean, this is not about climate, but it is highly connected to climate. We heard about the, the gap in piano or piano related, but I think it's a deeper uh, metaphor between women uh, and men 
or other types of categories. Uh, when we talk about climate, we also see that uh, happening. Um, we will talk later on also with, with Raul Canegolos from the Advent, the Advent Foundation about vulnerable communities. But I know Corina uh, has uh, an interest in also in vulnerable consumers. So talking about climate and in this framework of, of um, uh, who we are and who the others are, um, how do you see technology or do you see technology as an enabler for supporting those that are uh, to a large extent vulnerable in face of climate, uh, be it energy, food or other items? Thank you very much as well for the invitation. Um, it uh, a very interesting reunion and um, it actually doesn't happen often that uh, at least in Romania um, energy policy issues and particularly issues around energy poverty are intermingled with the conversation around technology and that's I think because um, on the one hand uh, we are still um, discussing policies in silos um, in Romania so um, I think the, the all issues related to technology are um, discussed and addressed by the technology community, by the ministry that's taking care of that, and all issues related to energy are being um, discussed and debated by the Ministry of Energy. And to add on that, all issues related to poverty are being addressed by the social assistance community, by the Ministry of Labor community. And whenever we have one of these interdisciplinary topics, um, we kind of fail to uh, design the mechanisms to, to address it. Um, I believe, for instance, when it comes to energy poverty and uh, vulnerable consumers in Romania, it's the lack of um, basic technological tools that has led us to this current situation um, in which for in in which the, the government has decided to offer a blanket protection for all consumers in Romania, for all energy consumers, no matter their income, no matter their um, um, assets or, or anything like that. And that's a huge um, burden on our public budget at this moment um, and it's largely due to the fact that there aren't the databases in place and the basic technological tools in place to be able to identify who the vulnerable consumers are in the country and to target them. Um, and although we've been discussing about targeting vulnerable energy consumers for several years now, um, this lack of um, basic technological technological tools is preventing us from, from doing that. And then we resort to a very basic tool, this blanket protection mechanism, uh, which is close to 3% of our GDP, um, in the sense that we cap um, and reimburse somehow the energy bill for all consumers. Um, and I think, yeah, technology could play a great role. And here I'm really not referring to any of the issues that have been probably debated in these rooms for the past weeks around, you know, cutting edge, AI, uh, super fantastic automation tools, but it's really rather just uh, unifying a couple of population data databases between some institutions of the country. It's not uh, rocket science. Speaking of rocket science, um, I would go to Dennis, and I don't have a question about rocket science to him, uh, <laughs> but I do think that what sometimes what he and other um, uh, social entrepreneurs around the world uh, looks like rocket science, uh, although in itself is quite basic. Um, uh, Dennis, you, you work uh, in, in many countries, in, in many regions, and in particular in, in uh, regions of the world that are um, vulnerable not just to climate issues, but also to socioeconomic challenges. Um, I know you're being, building a, a, an app uh, for farmers and many other uh, issues. Uh, if you can, you know, inspire us a bit um, uh, in, in a couple of minutes on, on what you do and what is the role that you think technology can actually uh, play in the future, uh, either AI, automation or other types of tech um, in, yes. in your work. Yes. Uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation and hopefully next time I will be there at your event because I really like Bucharest a lot. <clears throat> but uh, thanks again. Okay, to, to set a bit of a context, for more than 10 years um, I am um, active in Africa, in various countries. We are doing landscape restoration, <clears throat> trying to restore the land that is totally degraded in many, many countries in Africa. It's one of the major issues for the whole continent of Africa. Africa is a big 
continent, 54 countries, but 30 countries are facing serious degradation issues and they are the driver for food issues, water issues, migration issues, but also climate issues. So <clears throat> for 10 years, we have been active on the ground, really inspiring hundreds of thousands of farmers to implement low tech solutions. Those solutions exist already for 8,000 years on the planet. It's as old as humanity. And it also at that time it worked, it's pure wisdom. So today, most of the people think that if a solution is not complicated enough, it cannot be a solution, which seriously is totally bullshit, forgive my words. So what we are doing in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Madagascar, in Ethiopia, Uganda, Togo, we really empower farmers to do the work themselves. Actually, they need to do the work themselves in order to transform those dry lands back into green lush fields again. And those techniques are really simple. They, they, I name them water harvesting. It's rain water harvesting the rains we manage um, and we do also nature-based solutions um, it's very popular as we speak and this is also a few thousand years old so what we do we bring techniques to people low tech and it's just a matter of implementation and then it's amazing what the results are now the first connection we had with technology is actually what we have been using already for many, many years, because as I'm now trying to explain to you what we are doing, the best way is just to show it. So for many years, we have been working with satellites. And because of that, we can do a lot of measurements, you know, on the ground and now already with the technology even below subsurface. It's amazing what already can be done and to show the world the before and after from space is the best thing that you can show to the world because you know as soon as you really see it from yellow to green you know that that is what it's all about and now and now it's it's very very interesting for me to be here in this panel because as we speak we will bring in much more technology and all kind of digital stuff like you already said yourself ai uh, Android, etc. And <clears throat> Africa is still in the midst of a digital revolution. Slowly, Europe is getting more to a purpose and consciousness revolution, but Africa is still in the midst of a digital revolution. And for the coming decades, a few hundred million people for the first time will have a mobile in their hands. So there's going to be a huge growth from a technology perspective and therefore Google and Facebook and all those big companies, they are there because the biggest growth market for them is in the continent of Africa, 1.3 billion people now, but it will double in 30 years, which is insane. And that uh, causes even more stress. Now, <clears throat> for more than two years, we have been working on a mobile digital platform that can be implemented in a very simple phone in Africa. Um, the phone, the name is uh, Technophone and it costs one five dollars, which is really cheap. Uh, within that, there's an Android program and we created an app that can easily be uh, worked with even for the people who have never had a mobile in their hands. So over the last year and a half, we did some serious testing with a few hundred farmers who never had a mobile in their hand, which was really fascinating because, you know, we are so used to technology and then to see people to use a phone for the first time is really extraordinary and exciting at the same time. But the way we build this app together with a lot of specialists was try to make it for them uh, on an intuitive way. And it's amazing how already in a relatively short time, they were able to use the phone and also to work with our app, which has the title Greener Land. And now 
this is our objective, which is an insane objective, but you need to think insane because the problems that are growing every day in Africa are truly frightening. I mean, imagine that a continent will double in population. You know, the average age of Africa as a continent is now 19 years old. So 19 is extremely young. They are full of energy. And of course, they want to have livelihood for themselves. But then again, because of the ecosystems running backwards, creating so much stress, we see, you know, um, we see people leaving their habitats and they can only go to Europe and you cannot blame them because the, the only way is up for them. But the forecast on migration waves from Africa to Europe for the common 10, 15, 20 years, to be honest, are quite frightening. It could be apocalyptic and you cannot blame them because if you starve from food, you don't have any water, of course you want to go to Europe because you know that, you know, there you can create a living. And now our goal from now to the year 2030, and we work with a lot of organizations, we try to bring this mobile app, this digital platform to 350 million farmers in 30 countries for the coming decades. And that on itself is a crazy ambition. But then again, and I also would like to explain a little bit on that, it's very important to really understand that people should know about the existence of this mobile platform. So communication is key. And that is also what Just Dig It is doing. We work with a huge global media partners creative agencies like Havas and Yese Deco and also lots of local organizations. So, um, and as we speak, we are now talking to huge African influencers, artists, musicians, you know, soccer players, because they need to play a role in the movement. And, and our I think, challenge... And I think for, sorry, Dennis, for, for barging in, sorry. Um, I think yeah. uh, also the, the ITU, and we have some ITU representatives here, are... are are also uh, relevant in, in these conversations. Um, I don't want to interrupt you. I will actually come back to you with, we have two questions for you already, but for the sake of time. Um, and yes, continue okay. sorry, but I wanted to create some context. Well, okay, no worries. I think, I think, I think it's, it's mandatory that we understand more of the world around us uh, and the solutions that are, are there. Uh, and to continue on what you said about not just Africa, but in the end, climate uh, migration, um, I think this is one of the biggest challenges that we're not really talking about um, around the world. And when we do, we talk about it as is, as if it is just a, a problem that we need to stop, but not as a problem that we need to uh, go for the root causes and, and find solutions for that. Um, I actually, you know, coming back on, on this technology for good in the end, uh, and and to to Margaret, I mean, you work for UiPath. You're a global company. You have a footprint around the world. Um, can you think of a couple of uh, ways in which AI and automation is doing, um, not similar necessarily to what Dennis is doing, but using technology, affordable maybe even technology, to push for for change? Because in the end, expensive technology is not um, uh, useful always for for some of the things that we need. Absolutely. Thank you uh, for the question. I think uh, when we when we think about automation and software automation, uh, we often um, visualize the traditional business benefits, right? The immediate return on investment, which is very important, and it's really important to measure. It's really important to achieve. But at the same time, and we've seen that throughout um, uh, the use cases that we have developed together with our partners and our customers, that in addition to those traditional benefits, there are other types of benefits that emerge, other types of results, the ones that drive that kind of positive change. But you need to first see them, right? So this is not often uh, easy. You And again, to my point earlier, if, we, if you are intentional about something, you will then also map more easily these types of angles that oftentimes are overlooked by businesses. So just to define a, a few themes that right now we're, we're looking at through the automation for good um, lens. One of them is health and well-being. The second one is social impact. And by social impact, we think about accessibility. We think about 
collaborating with nonprofits and um, you know in improving inclusion and diversity. Uh, and last but not least, it's uh, the topic of, of the panel, right? It's environment and sustainability. Uh, with a focus on sustainability, I think here uh, the conversation becomes even more um, interesting in, in terms of how it can blend with technology. Um, and um, for, for specific use cases, I think it would be easier if we would cluster um, the, the, the way in which we can use the technology in at least three ways. One of them is how we can um, obtain sustainable results just by using automation, right? What what would be the easiest way to, to measure this kind of impact? Um, the first result being one, obviously, uh, less paper, right? So when, when you use digital technology uh, and, you know, aim to, to eliminate the paper trail, that's very easy to measure. Um, then it's about efficiency, more efficient processes, uh, help also um, in 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 uh, in becoming more agile and becoming more um, aware of your consumption patterns. So that would be, I think, the easiest category, right? The second one is what type of challenges do you want to overcome with the help of technology? So now we need to think about the processes. When you think about the processes and you're in an organization, what's the easiest way to go and look for? Uh, if you're a big organization, you probably have an ESG agenda, you have an ESG strategy, you have a sustainability strategy. Um, and I advise everyone that's interested in leveraging automation for the purpose of sustainability to go and look at that strategy and think about those kinds of processes and those areas that with the help of technology and not necessarily you know, automation, but technology in general, you can move those targets closer to the present day. Uh, is it about you know, lowering like uh, specific um, resources in, in, a, in a department? Think about how you can actually do that through the help of technology. And if you, um, if you, if you notice, the first kind of challenge is um, data. It's becoming first aware of your consumption patterns. And um, this is an area where technology can definitely help with data accessibility and quality. And um, Corina was, was mentioning earlier, the, um, you know, not so often we're also faced with, uh, with um, the challenge of legacy applications. Well, there you go. If you're in a big organization, you're going to see legacy applications and you're going to see newer applications. So if you need to monitor a specific set of data, you will oftentimes need to combine those data sources. And the third uh, category would be uh, the more complex kind of integrations that you can, again, uh, do with, with technology. So lowering your carbon footprint, uh, for example, with, with automation or with automation and IoT. That's where you need, you know, obviously to collaborate cross-function. You need to work together with the automation and, you know, artificial intelligence experts and your sustainability experts. And as Corina was mentioning earlier, it's not always in policy or not only in policy or in other kinds of areas in the public sector that things happen in silos. Sometimes it's also within your organization. So for those use cases to happen, you need to bring more teams together and put them at the same table to give them a common challenge. You sort of led to a, a question for Corina. I, I know a couple of days ago or weeks, she talked about how some targets by some companies are not really realistic. Um, and the, or we were talking about this, um, and that is because it's more about ambition and less about um, realistic data. Um, in the same time, when we talk about how do we tackle the climate crisis, we need data to measure and to actually understand how bad it is or how our consumption or, or output is. Um, there is no magical solution, but what are some solutions that you see uh, when we talk about the private uh, uh, ecosystem, which is in itself, in theory, faster, more agile, uh, and, and more resourceful sometimes than the public system? Uh, Dr. Scholl recommended to us, uh, and I took snippets of the screen as well, a couple of books earlier, but um, when I was invited on this panel, I immediately um, remember the book that I recently read, uh, which deals particularly with more of this 
philosophical approach to technology and climate. Um, it's called The Wizard and the Prophet by Charles Mann. Uh, and it actually talks about um, two early 20th century um, very unknown scientists, but who have produced a lot of impact globally. One of them is uh, William Vogt, who's um, a renowned American ornithologist, and he is the founder of the environmentalist movement. Um, passed away, I think, in the early 60s sometimes. Um, and his perception is that we simply need to consume less. Um, it's not about figuring out what tools to, to implement, uh, but it's about consuming less. Humans are grabbing, uh, and that was, remember, in the 50s, between 25 and 40 percent of the entire world's output of resources. Um, so his mantra was, uh, cut, cut, cut. We are over farming, over using water resources, so we need to go back to a philosophy of frugality. Uh, and that's, I think, where still a big part of the environmental movement um, is, is in, um, this prof prophetic perspective. Vogt is the prophet in the book and the wizard is uh, is another guy. Um, he, they lived around the same time but uh, didn't talk to each other. Uh, Norman Borlaug. Uh, he's um, um, referred to as the um, father of the Green Revolution because sent, he was sent by the Rockefeller Foundation in Latin America essentially to discover how crops can uh, yield mu uh, much higher um, yields than, than usually. And uh, basically through intense technology, um, um, lab engineering and so on, he did manage to genetically re-engineer seeds and, and bring about uh, higher yields. And his belief was that with this radical technological innovation, we're going to um, uh, be able to save the planet and ultimately ourselves. So I think that whenever we talk about this intersection between climate and technology, we actually somehow need to position ourselves within in one of these two fundamentally different camps. Um, my take on it is that I think technology needs to deliver on some of these prophetic goals of reducing consumption. Um, and uh, if, if I'm to talk about energy, I think, because that's my, my field of expertise, where I teach, where I, where I do research, um, there are, um, I think this is where technology needs to focus. How do we reduce consumption, energy consumption in all uh, walks of life from individual household consumption to um, um, uh, industrial consumption. I personally do not believe in these wizard goals of uh, um, identifying some new form of energy or fundamentally, uh, I don't know, burying carbon in some deep hole in the earth or sending it to the moon or so on. No, I think simply we need to reduce consumptions. And there are uh, very interesting um, areas where the solutions are already there, technology is already there. Uh, and uh, Margareta was saying earlier about uh, measuring the consumptions and how uh, technology can help us with that. Um, technology for measuring real consumptions of energy has been around for several years. Uh, smart meters, I think we've all heard of them. Um, and the reason why, at least in Romania, now I think we're going to have a hard time if we're able if we're going to be able at all to um, achieve this goal, we're going to have a hard time to meet this, um, the newest European target of reducing peak consumptions. Uh, simply because we do not have smart meters rolled out in the country to be able to tell us uh, when we consume energy. There's a profile of the consumption for 24 hours or even for longer, but not hour by hour. So I think it's, it's really um, putting technology in this uh, service of reducing consumption and using what is already out there, not um, at least for now. I think, I, I, although I do find that radical technological innovation is needed in some areas that have to do with what Margareta was saying earlier, and namely affordability. 40% of Romania's population uh, lives in the countryside and they heat themselves with firewood, simply by burning firewood in stoves, right? So the question is, what kind of technological device, a wizard type of technological device this time, you know, speaking of the prophet of the wizard, can we devise for them to heat themselves in a low carbon affordable way? I don't have the solution to that. And I think it's going to be, you know, up to the technology guys in the audience to come up with it. We, can you, thank you. Uh, I think that we, that we heard before, um, is also uh, critical, um, but there's also the them uh, that we need to talk about. Um, Corina was mentioning about vulnerable, vulnerable groups in, in Romania, and I dare to say some other countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and Dennis was talking about a large portion 
of, of tomorrow's uh, citizens that are in the same situation, uh, obviously more complicated sometimes. Um, and I heard this, this and this is, has been bugging me for many years, consume less. Um, can we, and we, if we talk about Africa in particular, um, how can we ask, or, or any other uh, continent for that matter, or any other city in the world, how could we ask uh, a new generation of uh, uh, hungry for technology and hungry uh, for, for progress uh, for, to consume less when the model is to consume as much as we can? Uh, so well, the question that I have for Dennis is, is, is not raising. Really, is there a technology or are there technologies that you see that can help us consume less in any part of the world or can we find a more philosophical and educational uh, solution to that? Um, the, but I guess the answer is neither, uh, but I'm going to let Dennis to share the burden of uh, a complicated question. Is to a person <laughs> who's trying to help people uh, to maybe in the future uh, with the fact that they can consume something, because that's the whole issue, you know, there are now a few hundred million people fighting in poverty because there's nothing to consume, you know, no water, no food, there's huge stress. So this question, you know, for consumption is more for, you know, the Western part of the world, but it's definitely the other question you should ask me because we are there to try, you know, to restore the land, to hold the water and to create food for them. They are living below zero. And we are here to try to restore as much as uh, we can for the coming decade. And, and, the and the traditional way of implementing and designing these programs are not going in the right speed. So, and that's because of, you know, the, the lack of skills and innovation within the world of NGOs. And now this, you know, this whole technology revolution is really uh, gaining gear, which is very much needed because... I truly believe that the low-tech solutions that exist combined with the high-tech that we can now combine can maybe, you know, create enormous progress in, a, in a, the restoration field, which is extremely important because there is no time to lose. I think there is no time to lose and I think there's a lot of time to be gained. Um, um, I have, a, in, in the spirit of uh, social innovation solutions panels, I would like to ask any of the panelists to ask any of the panelists a short question. So, Marga, Corina, or Dennis, if you have a question for any of the other two panelists, uh, this is your uh, moment. I might have a question for uh, Margareta, and uh, it's been. Um... It has to do a little bit with what was uh, brought up earlier around the difficulty of coming up with standards for ethical AI. And uh, you talk about automation for good. The Social Innovation Solutions is talking also about automation for good. How about good automation? The, the, uh, I'm just wondering what you think of. That's the centerpiece. We, <laughs> if we don't have good automation, we don't but have But it's like how to build for... inherently good algorithms yeah. not not to program them for something good but how are they inherently good yeah no absolutely that's that's a that's a great question and the way that um, we're looking at the bigger let's say initiative around automation for good is one how do we make sure that we deliver good in the world with the help of automation by the way we're designing and implementing it which has to do a lot with what you said, uh, and uh, also uh, a lot with um, the, the education and the uh, commitment to upskilling and reskilling, to making accessible uh, career pathways for, for automation. But also from early on, how do we design um, automation solutions that they are, um, you know, ethical, that they don't create any bias, that they address um, important issues as inclusion and diversity from the design phase. The second one is that uh, the, the one that I discussed earlier, the more technical one, what are the use cases? So how do we actually um, um, use the technology to get that level of positive change through concrete examples. So there's a wizard and the prophet also in this approach, if you think about it. And I think those two are essential to bring together. You need to have a soft you know, approach. You need to have a, 
always a human-centered approach when it comes to developing technology so that you create and protect humans in, in the context of technology, but you also need to be very practical about it and you need to be the wizard and thinking about, okay, where do I deploy this so that I'm not just keeping it in a, you know, in a space out there? Where do I put this um, in action? Dennis, please. Sorry. Dennis, please. Yes. Oh, and I, I, sorry, I don't have a question and someone is now talking to me at the same time so uh i have no questions thank you okay okay thank you uh we do have about seven minutes left uh and uh i apologize again to the ones that are watching us online and the ones here and then to dennis i know he has a, a busy schedule and doing amazing things if there's a question from the audience don't forget you can you know raise your hand um but i do have a question for the whole of the panel with a short answer um some of us worked or work in, in non-governmental organizations in the impact field. Um, and the question is, what do you think is the biggest challenge that, that impact-driven organizations have in adopting uh, technology? And how can we find a wizardish solution to get to, um, to, get to that? So uh, I, uh, I just then, said, it in, in, I said it in my previous short uh, talk. It's the lack of skills and the lack of willing to innovate within the world of NGOs. I've been working now for, for many, many years, for a few decades with various NGOs, and they are so uh, accustomed to the way that they work. And, and now everyone is realizing that the speed of this traditional approach is not uh, good for, for, for the results. So, but the, the, the major problem is that the, the world of the NGOs, the people who work there and the, the technology people, they totally speak a different language. And that is something that really needs to be bridged. I, I think the cause why uh, civil society organizations are not deploying more technology is simply because in many parts of the world, they are the firefighters. Um, so uh, whether they are delivering social services, um, it means actually, um, being in a permanent state of catering to the most vulnerable um, and um, firefighting all sorts of crises. If we're talking about civil society organizations that do advocacy and fight against corruption and so on, there's always some corruption scandal to uh, extinguish and to, to demonstrate against and to lobby against and so on. So I really find that the civil society sector is under-resourced and permanently fighting fires. So um, the, the space, uh, material, financial, human to innovate, to identify uh, new technological ways of uh, fulfilling um, organization's mission, it's very difficult to find. They are permanently in this uh, kind of overstretch burnout mode. So, Any wizard magical solutions, Corina? Mm -hmm. Um, I think probably has to do with this uh, um, title of the panel, you know, multi-stakeholder collaboration and realizing that um, um, unless we solve them, social problems are going to hit us equally, whether we are an NGO representative or a, go or a government representative or a, a business representative, and then how do we put the best of um, the, the resources and the, the capabilities and the skills that we each excel at together um, to be able to fulfill a common mission. And it's easier said than done because, you know, collective impact is something that uh, organizations have been striving to achieve for a long time and have difficulties doing. But yeah, multi-stakeholder collaboration probably is a way to overcome this difficulty that civil society is experiencing all over the world, I think. I can also give a very quick example of this kind of collaboration. Um, and I completely agree with what was said previously. Um, we we have um, a very interesting story from one of our customers. Unfortunately, I can I can tell the name right now, but it's a very large customer that has a big community of practice of automation professionals. So when you work with automation and obviously new technologies, you have an eternal pool of talent of people that you know, have the skills and work on the those said projects. Um, and because many organizations nowadays have at the um, at the team level, at the business unit level, um, social impact kind of KPIs, the team leader of that community uh, of practice was thinking, 
how can I bring social impact, uh, you know, uh, at the community level with the talent and with the skills that I have? So uh, they were thinking about creating this, this kind of bridge. And the idea that they had is why don't we connect with a nonprofit organization that we already support from a financial perspective at the enterprise level, right? Through all those uh, CSR initiatives that big companies have and create um, an internal challenges for our professionals to go and automate processes for those nonprofits because nonprofits can also benefit, of course, from automation the same as business organizations can because they also face uh, repetitive tasks. They also have uh, big, large volumes and most uh, importantly, they also have resource scarcity. So more important, they could really benefit from that level of efficiency. So in this example, you have kind of like a technical way of, uh, of leveraging your, uh, your volunteering program. And at the same time, you know, helping a community and a nonprofit that's operating in a community around you. Probably not the easiest way to think about how automation can drive social impact through volunteering, but it happened. And if it happened once, it can happen uh, several times. I think this is a great conclusion to, to the panel. Um, how can NGOs uh, that are active in the impact uh, industry, and most of them are and or should be, um, to actually work with companies or companies actually to work with NGOs to support them. Uh, I completely, of course, agree with, with Dennis's point that scarcity of res human resources, not just capital, is, is critical. Uh, I want to thank him for, for joining us uh, and for his uh, amazing work in restoring land, but also hope um, across Africa. Uh, and I dare to say not just across Africa, because what you do there has meaning and can uh, act as inspiration across the world. We do have in this part of the world, in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, uh, large climate uh, challenges that are and will re be reflected in the way people live. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, it's, it's a huge uh, it's a huge challenge. Thank you uh, also to Corina Morafa and and, uh, and to Margareta Mochibabic for joining us. Uh, we will slowly and and uh, have a, a great. Um, um, a day, uh, well, evening ahead. Dennis, thanks a lot for joining us. Um, and we slowly much. move to to the um, complicated story of the public sector panel. I will uh, um, thank you again for joining us. Um, and I will slowly move to to ask uh, our next speakers, which are Daniel Spoyala, Data Economy Advisor at the German Agency for International Cooperation and former ITU. Um, um, uh, representative uh, Dragos Tohanan, uh, he's v Vice President of the Romanian Authority for the for the Digitalization of Romania, and Raluca Nicolescu Balac, Executive Director of the UiPed Foundation, and online. Very happy to be joined by uh, Marta Arsovka uh, Tomovska. I apologize for for the the, the mispronunciation. She's Director for Digital uh, Government of the Office of the Prime Minister in Serbia, um, and I think. Um, the, the components of the panel also might result in a conversation about Central and Eastern Europe, but I think challenges in the public administration are similar, if not sometimes identical, across the world, from, um, from Kinshasa to Tokyo, or maybe not Tokyo that much, but definitely um, uh, around the world. So, um, uh, hello, uh, um, my guess is that you're in Belgrade, but, uh, but yes. I might be wrong. Yes, so, uh, yes. hello uh, from Belgrade. Uh, from great to see you and from, the um, from, uh, from Belgrade. Uh, and thank you to our uh, uh, guests. Um, I would actually start by sort of the end of the panel before uh, when we talked about how um, NGOs and the, the, the charity and impact world um, can work better with uh, technology. And then we switch obviously to the public field. But uh, we have with us Raluca Nicolescu Balac, she's uh, running the UiPet Foundation with, uh, I'd say, global impact, uh, answering to that question, uh, and then moving towards how can uh, the civil society and NGO world support through tech mechanisms, uh, the public system. 
Yeah. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I think we're in a quite privileged situation of UiPath Foundation because we have been founded by UiPath uh, back in January 2019. And while we're, we're a different legal entity, we are connected to an incredible ecosystem of people who support us in our mission to enable underprivileged children from Romania and India to have access to quality education. So in the past four years, uh, we've engaged many volunteers and happy to see some of them in, in the room this evening. Um, and uh, they have been um, supporting us and implementing uh, uh, technological solutions, many of them focused on automation um, in order to take off the administrative burden from our day-to-day -day work um, in marginalized communities and to allow us to spend more time on building meaningful educational journeys um, for the kids and for their families. Um, so I guess that my, my perspective um, is, is quite biased in the sense that we are very lucky to be one of the nonprofits that is leading the way in implementing technology um, to advance social good. Um, at the same time, we work with um, other private companies and nonprofits and we build uh, long-term partnerships to identify which are the best um, technological solutions to answer to the um, uh, digital literacy crisis in Romania and worldwide. Um, and in that sense, and to move to the second question, Chibrian, um, uh, last year, because we are focusing very much on um, developing the digital competencies of kids who are living in poor communities. And you would say that, well, that's the last priority when you don't have food on the table and maybe you don't have electricity and you're living in very difficult conditions. But at the same time, I think we need to be pragmatic as societies and to understand that we can't afford to leave these kids even more behind. So interventions that focus on addressing basic needs and um, the general educational gap have to go hand in hand with developing digital literacy for these kids so they will not become the so-called useless generation in 15, 20 years. So it's sort of our duty as a society to do that. And um, while building uh, digital literacy um, programs for, for kids in poverty, we discovered that there's no um, assessment tool, standardized assessment tool for, for digital literacy. So we developed one from, from scratch. And this is one of the tools that is free of charge and it will be soon translated in English. We developed it with our partner Brio um, in Romania. And um, we do think this is one of the solutions that could be transferred in the public system and used by all schools and teachers. Maybe we take it to Serbia since we're at it. Um, uh, because I think that the literate, like digital literacy is a challenge that we, we all have. Uh, and I'm glad to also uh, have a, a representative of the of the Authority for Digitalization with us, uh, because not just in Romania, but in other countries, and uh, if if Serb, oh, not just Romania, of course, but there's a huge uh, challenge in in uh, in the in digital literacy, not just uh, in individuals, speaking of children, but also in companies and public system. So there's a deeper question that I'm going to come back uh, on, on how can we actually increase that. Now, I think it's obvious why we need to do that. Uh, it's We know we can financially, but it's, uh, it's another uh, story on, on how. I would go to, to Belgrade now, um, uh, to, to Marta, and I was curious, you know, in, in brief, in a minute or so, um, how is the um, artificial intelligence ecosystem uh, in Serbia doing, um, and, and not just AI, but other types of technologies um, in relation, obviously, to, to public uh, policy and public yeah, administration. Is, um, can, you, can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah. So, yes, in Serbia, there is a huge progress uh, in the technological domain overall. So, uh, IT industry is one of the biggest export sectors, basically, in Serbia, if not the biggest. And uh, every second job position that was created in the past uh, year was in IT sector. So it's, uh, uh, it's it not only AI, but general. 
So uh, AI has been positioned as one of the priorities of the government. And basically in 2019, we adopted the AI strategy uh, upon which we have set uh, our priorities for the different stakeholder groups in, in the country. Uh, and in the same time, we have established AI Institute, which is the first um, educational research and development institute on the domain on AI in the southeastern Europe. And we are really happy to start to establish in collaboration with the neighboring countries and with the countries in the region. But also we have included AI into education, which is really interesting. And I think that country can benefit from this example because we have already two AI subjects in the primary schools. Uh, in the elementary schools, and then we have three subjects in high schools. We have uh, all over the higher education, we have seven master programs on AI, uh, which is really interesting to see, you know, not only AI per se, but also AI combined with all other industries. In um, Also, we have established in the National Data Center, the AI supercomputer, which is available uh, to the startups, uh, to the universities, and also to the public sector. And we are also implementing AI education for the public sector. So uh, public servants in Serbia, they learn about uh, emerging technologies, including AI, during their you know, uh, everyday curricula. And the, the only thing that I would add here is that we have really uh, several cases of use cases of implementation of AI and automation in the public sector. Oh, I think we will come back to that. I'm, I'm very curious personally to see how our neighbors are doing uh, and also a tiny bit jealous, I must admit. Um, but uh, going to uh, uh, back to, to Romania, this is a, obviously a global conversation. I think what happens in Romania is is very important to what happens in many European and, and uh, other countries around the world, from Latin America to, to African countries uh, and Southeast Asia. Uh, I would move uh, now to, to my uh, left, to, to Dragos uh, Tohnean. He's the uh, Vice President of the Authority for the Digitalization of Romania. If you have a reaction to what Marta was saying, I think um, we do a lot, but do we do as much? We can do more. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, so when when we talk about uh, different aspects of the public sector, we have to take into consideration um, different different aspects that are changing uh, very fast. We talk about uh, data. We talk about new technologies, infrastructure, digital services, or development of digital skills. So I'm coming also back to what um, Raluca ne uh, Negulescu mentioned about education. Uh, education is actually the foundation about uh, the digital skills in order to build or create a digital public sector, you need um, to have the resources and the people uh, to understand what uh, such skills are or such uh, changes uh, bring. Um, of course, uh, we encourage a good collaboration between uh, public and private sector. Uh, we uh, have common projects also with UiPath and also with other uh, stakeholders. Um, we try to develop uh, national strategies and also to um, build up the skill sets of the employees of the public sector in order to gain or understand the best practices from the private private sector because the private sector is accelerating at a much faster speed and uh, the public sector has to gain up or to uh, bring up the uh, the gap that's between the two the two the tools but in, in common education is the is the foundation for the future of uh, as 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 the title says automation for good or automation for the public I think we all need more uh, automation in our lives, in particular because we need more time uh, in our lives. I think automation gives us that. There's a lot of, there's not, there's some use cases in, in, in Serbia and, and Romania and Greece and then many other countries in this part of the world on how automation supports and gives time to overburdened uh, yeah, employees definitely. of the state. Um, I know there's some money on the table for that. There's about 22 million euro roughly. Um, Some you can roughly say around twenty plus. Twenty plus. Um, um, Thirty. Okay. Um, 
is this enough, uh, or how is the, the the these how are these funds going to be put in practice, and how do you think this will give more time to uh, the employees of uh, the mayor uh, in in some small uh, village even? So the the key word is time. Uh, our citizens uh, don't. Uh, don't give us that much time so um, that's why we try to invest in uh, as many projects or as many uh, possibilities to digitalize the interaction between the public sector and uh, and the citizens itself that's the key message that we want to transmit today because um, seat, uh, our citizens or uh, employees also of the public sector are eager or wants to uh, optimize or um, digitalize their work uh, sometimes in different uh, sectors it's um, it's hard to do that because also people are uh, not embracing the change but uh, if if we go into the concept of continuous learning or continuous development then also the automation will uh, will be part of that change because okay we we talk about different aspects or differences between digitization digitalization and digital transformation um, part of those three aspects that i mentioned earlier also cover auto automation or uh, aspects about uh, different technologies such as Internet of Things or uh, blockchain or different uh, creation of platforms in order to speed up the process of uh, the, the public sector. But uh, the, the baseline is we change slowly, but in a good way so all of the people can adapt to those changes of the public sector because we also have to take into consideration the differences between uh, rural, rural and urban uh, areas uh, the the changes occur faster in big cities like bucharest or brasov or timisoara in romania or we have best practices from serbia or germany or other um, uh, european countries um, we try to make the changes for everybody not not for a specific target audience i think it's clear that we need more inclusivity and i think we need uh, more time or to some extent less time so faster digitalization of the public services is definitely a must as as you mentioned uh, sometimes time is is actually shorter than uh, imagined especially looking at the 2026 uh, financing not only 2026 2030 that's our goal or we say we want to digitalize 100 percent the complete public sector until then but uh, it's a long road uh, we have best practices collaborating with uh, with the private sector we have uh, the, as an example the national platform gisho pumro uh, which uh, was uh, a good collaboration in the past 10 years and together with the Ministry of Research, Innovation and Digitalization and uh, with, uh, the, with, Mr., uh, with the Minister, uh, Mr. Burduja, uh, we try to evolve this platform as an example. We are now uh, targeting to create the mobile apps for the, uh, for the platform itself and also integration of the um, Casiero Judiciar. As, as the somebody platform. was saying, uh, a company could have done that uh, yesterday but in the same time time is not always easy to get yeah uh, because there, of are, there are many stakeholders involved and uh, when you talk about money in the public sector uh, it's not easy to approve yeah um speaking of, of um, progress and speed uh, i would go to well to germany but to romania to some extent yeah. um uh, in the same time uh, we have with us daniel spoiler he's he's working for the german agency for international cooperation I would say it in German, but it would not be wise. Um, how do you see from that side of the um, of, of Europe in the end, uh, uh, to a large extent, a, a tech powerhouse of Europe? Uh, Germany is is strong, and not just by the companies it has there or funded, but also uh, uh, I'd say a rather good public service, digitalized public service. Um, how can we export? Uh, solutions, not German solutions necessarily, but tech uh, in other types of, of uh, public ecosystems. Yeah, I hello everybody. Uh, thank you, Cipriano, for the invitation to the, and the UiPath uh, company also. I will turn it a little bit and I will tell you that what I do, uh, I am coordinating a number of projects in Africa. This is what I do for the German Development Agency. And right now, why I'm, what I'm focusing is on a project that is called the uh, EU AU data flagship that has two objectives, how we can bring the benefits of data closer 
to the African citizens, not only to the big companies that are actually monetizing a lot of that data, and how do we protect data from being misused? Um, and what we are proposing in Europe, we had some. We have something that is called Team Europe. So we are six member states in this. Uh, we realize that Europe cannot go alone in developing countries. It has to be a package of what Europe can give, like the best. And what we are promoting is called a human-centric digital economy model, a human-centric data economy model. Uh, that is based on values, that is based on human rights, because we know very well that actually a technology is an instrument that can be used on both sides of, of the angle. Um, and how do we look at, how do I look at projects? For example, how, there is a question that is like, how can we transform the public system, the public administration to take up more AI solution, more digital transformation? And when we choose, for example, which country do we work in Africa, the first element is what is the, how high is digitalization on the public agenda? And this is a question also for Romania. It's like, how high is digitalization on the, on the uh, public agenda? Uh, and I'm always going to countries where digitalization is at the level of the president. Again, a question for Romania. Is digitalization there? Or what is how high is digitalization at the level in at the level in each country? Uh, because that gives a matter of how we perceive the importance of, of this type of this uh, the project. The second of all is like the difficulty that we are facing a lot is like why and why is important why is actually sometimes easier in Africa to do automation is because there is no legacy system. Legacy systems actually are the bottleneck of us trying to automate uh, a lot of these uh, uh, services. And of course, uh, we have to understand that in the digital transformation of any government, I'm putting my civil service hat, hat here, actually I'm, I'm doing this for a lot of time, thinking about how to digitalize governments, is 80% uh, is analog. It's not about technology. Every 80% is about like modifying procedures inside the public institution. And that means a public administration reform. Because we have to understand that automation will bring, uh, like, we will take people, a lot of people have to be reskilled in, in the public administration with automation. And this is a choice that we have to make. This is a political choice that we have to make. So I, I, I'm, I went around your question a little bit, but I think this is, I think setting up a little bit the scene on how can I can contribute to this panel better. Um, you talked about legacy systems, and I think this is a, a huge challenge uh, all around uh, Europe, uh, and I dare to say that also about other more advanced countries. Uh, I'm, I was curious about the legacy systems in Serbia, and if there's a, we were talking about wizards in the previous panel. Um, uh, now I'm going to talk about magicians. Is there a magic wand from Serbia that uh, countries in Africa, Europe, Latin America, etc., can use? Uh, I don't know whether it's the wizard or prophet or magic or whatever, but still, you know, uh, what Daniel said, it was uh, very important. So uh, he literally say that there is no point to discuss about digital transformation of the government if, if it is not high on the agenda, which is... 100% uh, true. So uh, in Serbia, we started back in 2017, which was really, really, really late, you know, uh, to start with the digital formation of the government. Uh, five, five years fast forward in today's, uh, in, in this year's report of the United Nations, this is the UNE government index, which is the most relevant uh, global report on the advancement on the e-government. We have been number 23 on the online service index, uh, which is ahead of 16 member states of EU. And um, before Canada, let's say, or Norway or Switzerland. And it is, you know, it is the dedication and it is the support that we received from the prime minister. I am director for uh, public administration reform and digital government in the office of the prime minister. So whatever he said, I just echo that. I have been, prior to being an advisor in Serbia to the prime minister, I have been myself minister 
uh, uh, in North Macedonia for digital ministry, basically, public administration and IT. We did have uh, IT uh, very high on the priorities, but there was no resources available in terms of money and budgets. And though we started like 15 years ago, the, Le the Ser Serbian government um, is much better now because of the dedication and, and putting the priority. So legacy systems are always there and we are trying to find a way to fight legacy systems. And I will refer again to Daniel on this. We are working uh, closely with GIZ in Serbia on the establishing of a GovTech program that is a, a, a two-year program we have just started uh, that will help us uh, include and involve the startups helping us to develop the latest technological solutions uh, they're using emerging technologies for the government and that is very interesting project and i encourage uh, also romanian government uh, to to get along with this and to start collaboration this because it is very promising because this is the way that you can basically get rid of the legacy system or minimize the legacy systems and start the uh, public procurement that is based on innovation and collaborate with startups which are basically bringing the new technologies and the emerging technologies in the government much better than the traditional let's say companies uh, it, it's like i had a chat with marta before but i didn't so she was actually she asked the question that i wanted to ask so um a reaction to this uh, and legacy I, in particular i have only one reaction coming to the first uh, point that uh, marta mentioned um, digital transformation should be uh, the scope of each government, especially for Romania. Um, uh, if we analyze a little bit the uh, this index where Romania stands at the moment in terms of uh, comparison with other European countries, we are on place 27. Um, we have a lot of uh, background to uh, to catch up. Uh, we have a lot of uh, changes to improve and uh, to implement. And uh, focusing on that, uh, digital transformation should be the focus of the government of Romania, which actually started to be step by step, and uh, we grow each uh, each month by, uh, and, by implementing and, solutions. And any um, um, perspectives on on minimizing the legacy systems? Um, how what's your take on that? Let's say the the legacy part is uh, not my not my main expertise. Uh, I'm, I'm more from a technical point of view. So uh, we focus a lot of uh, technolo technological change, and of course the the legal part uh, has a has a has a contribution to that as well. Lovely. Uh, and as mentioned before, if the uh, people in the audience also have any remarks or content or questions, you may raise a hand, and we will find a way to integrate you in the conversation. Uh, and speaking of, of conversation, we heard about uh, the public conversation that needs to be about um, digital transformation uh, for that to actually have a, a basis. Um, but I, I, would, I would extend it or expand it from digital transformation to digital literacy, not just for, um, uh, not just for the public system or the business system, which in the DESI report is not doing that well either. Uh, it's doing better than the uh, public system, but it's not doing that good. Um, and also to increase it to uh, children and, and across the board. Um, I have a question to both of you actually, and then I would come back to Marta. Uh, and the question is, is actually related to what do you think um, the public systems can learn and actually use from the private, and you are you are private uh, uh, sector to understand, uh, what's your take on this and what have you seen in Africa that actually moves, uh, uh, you know, faster? It's not just about big businesses coming to uh, the government and saying we should use this solution or the government going back, but also the third actor uh, on the market. Yeah. Um... I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because it turns a bit the table and it talks about digital transformation and digital literacy, not only from the public institution perspective, but also from the angle of the end user that 
it's it's the citizen, right? So I think that that's an important conversation we need to have and to put ourselves in the shoes of the citizens who will use this uh, uh, digital uh, systems and how uh, the public administration can find the best way to accommodate the needs uh, of the people. And it's it's interesting, uh, Ciprian, that you mentioned um, Africa. And um, uh, yesterday we uh, launched, in, launched in Romania an app, a uh, uh, reading app for mobile phones that is free of charge for, for children across the country and that has actually been used uh, for a while in Rwanda and Kenya. And it's been approved uh, as being very effective in tackling um, general literacy, which is an important prerequisite for digital literacy. And as unfortunately you probably all know, 40% of the children in Romania are um, um, are, uh, have an issue related to functional illiteracy. That means that they can read the text, but they can't understand much of it. So in order to make sure that indeed all these um, digital um, uh, skills uh, can be developed and we can have digi digital citizens um, in, in the following years, we have to make sure that the citizens are also functionally uh, literate and they're, they're able to navigate um, what digital uh, citizenship means and their rights and they can access all these platforms for, for their uh, well-being. So I think this is a, a very important perspective we have to uh, keep in mind. Daniel, any leapfrogging that you see in Africa that we can also use in, in Serbia and Romania and Bulgaria and other countries in the region when it comes to digitalizing citizens doesn't really sound good how I say it but yeah so you are seeing across Africa a number of systems appearing um, I don't know from the financial sector in Nigeria uh, where uh, I work very closely with the uh, with Estonian companies for example and Marta thank you for mentioning GovStack that is one of the GIZ leading uh, leading projects right now uh, and uh, congratulations for being part of it um, now uh, what we are seeing is that because we spoke a lot now about literacy and literacy is actually an issue uh, that we are facing in africa as well imagine that is as as uh, the previous panelists has mentioned is the youngest continent on the planet uh, that is a source of uh, great risk for the future if those people will not have a, what we call, call a livelihood there uh, especially from the point of view of migration, because the only place that they can go is Europe. And this is actually the purpose of development cooperation. This is what we are doing. What we are doing is to try to build livelihoods there. And digitalization is a, a big instrument. And looking at digital literacy um, uh, is something that is tackled, it's not tackled sufficiently. For example, we don't have a clear standard, even at the UNESCO level. You, uh, where we understand what are the main elements for to be digital literate or to have the digital skills what is does that mean actually um on second thing we don't have any statistics in africa we have statistics about everything in africa on the digital sector very few statistics about we don't know how many digital literate people are in africa right now what is the need we know that there is a lot of frugal innovation, so they know what people are understanding how to use a smartphone. And this is the case also in Romania. I'm always looking like I'm comparing how, what is the trend of Romania adopting or Romanians adopting digital transformation, even if that, that tomorrow they will be there, the government will place them there. When, for example, we have one of the lowest rates of using um, uh, banking, services that actually is first indicator if you don't use something that is so useful as a mobile banking uh, banking app where you don't need to go every day to the bank to do something what will be ad the adoption of uh, actually uh, I, i'm curious curiosity from gishow.ro which is uh, a yes we had two questions uh, which is a romanian um, digital system to pay taxes in brief uh, what is the, do you have data on the usability? How many people are using it or percentage? So I can uh, give some numbers. Uh, before the pandemic in the uh, Gishou.ro platform, we had around uh, 
400,000 users. Um, and currently we have 1.7 million. So uh, thanks to the pandemic, uh, it grew a lot. Um, uh, we have 90% uh, of the big cities in Romania already enrolled in the platform. The problem is with uh, with the rural society uh, or uh, the, the rural, rural representation of the administration. We have only 30%. But uh, most of the taxes uh, grew a lot also from a uh, finance point of view. Uh, we collected only, I think, in September. The, the, the amount collected in 2022 from January to September is the same amount we collected in the first 10 years. So that you see how much the, the application grew. Well, there's magic ones uh, happening uh, as well uh, here. We have a question from Corina and then the gentleman there. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I used to think as well that the center of government is the solution and bringing things up to the center of government, uh, whether it's president's office or prime minister's office. But looking at some policy areas which have been quite high on the agenda in Romania in the past years, you know, education and building highways um, and comparing that level of centrality of policy with the um, actual results that we see in practice, I don't tend to believe that the center of government is anymore the solution. Um, so maybe, and here's a question to Mr. Tohanan and to uh, Mrs. Tomowska, um, how about some hacks that we can build inside the public administration system so that the civil, the civil servants would take up digitalization objectives and targets? And here I'm thinking, for instance, in Romania, but um, of course there's a similar process in Serbia as well. Each ministry undergoes yearly through an institutional strategic planning process in which they assume targets and goals, and now the Ministry of Finance is also tying the budget to that. So how about inserting in the institutional strategic plan of each ministry, whether it's agriculture or energy, on the environment, digitalization objectives as some type of a mandatory cross-cutting objective to which they should be setting real targets and real indicators, not, you know, number of hours of um, classes that civil servants attend, but kind of output indicators, results indicators. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, please. Yeah, thank you very much for this wonderful discussion on automation. And actually, I'm I'm really impressed by the discussion on digital transformation that <coughs> should be the top priority. And one of the biggest concerns, when we talk of digital transformation, we're talking of transformation across all sectors. And one of the biggest challenge that comes with that is see the uh, policies are implemented in silo and you see your policies for agriculture, policies for transportation, for energy, that they don't talk about digital transformation. Here you have, for example, the ministry responsible for ICT and digital transformation, talking of uh, digital transformation. So how, what is the practical way that you can bring uh, all sectors, all ministries, the whole government to take this as a priority agenda and all the policies to put uh, digital transformation as the first priority to make sure that we're transforming across sectors and not just touching it in silos. Uh, I heard from Serbia that being in Prime Minister's office, sometimes it helps, but now the concern is, uh, for example, in most of the African countries, if you want something to be done, you take it to the Prime Minister's office because everybody has to do. But are we going to take everything to, to the Prime Minister's office so that it can be implemented? Well, I, I hope not. Uh, your name and then perhaps uh, where you come from or where you work? Oh, my name is Emmanuel Manasse. I come from Tanzania. Thank you. And you work in a ministry? I'm I work with the regulator responsible for uh, communicate, electronic and postal communication. And I'm the director of industrial affairs. Thank you. Thank you. So we have two very different questions, but I dare to say they're very similar to some extent. So um, whoever wants to take it, Marta. I leave Marta the first place, and then I go second. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, very good questions. Excellent questions. Uh, I, just to clarify, uh, we are sitting in the office of the Prime Minister and there is a team for public administration reform and e-government but also in Serbia there is an office for IT and e-government which is similar as the agency for digital transformation in Romania and also other ministries have their IT teams so it is just the coordination that is done there we are not doing it we're not developing it uh, from the from the office of the Prime Minister uh, and uh, Coming back to the question whether 
uh, every government agency should have some uh, should have digital transformation as some of the priorities in their strategic plans. Uh, this has been done, and uh, now we have. Uh, I can speak about Serbia, and we have the majority of public services digitalized, and the ma majority of back office services are digitalized. Of course, there is a center of government digital infrastructure, which is this interoperability platform, service generators, uh, all the building blocks that are uh, really important for the government. And now we are going to a, a higher level, which is not basic digital transformation, which is digitizing public services, but including automation and AI. So in order to, uh, you know, that automation and AI are really, you know, the more advanced level of digital transformation of the government because algorithms can just improve the delivery of public services and they can help reimagine re the service delivery. Also, software robots, they can automate uh, routine tasks and save time and money. AI and machine learning can, on the other hand, help deliver uh, data-driven policies. Uh, blockchain also can help in increase is the transparency and the accountability. So these are the projects that we are thinking of now. In order to be able to do that, we have set this GovTech project, which is basically having a number of external consultants that are really good in digital transformation and that has done this for the private sector, entering government agencies uh, because they understand the latest technologies, and helping them, uh, uh, let's say, uh, source or identify some of the projects which involve artificial intelligence or IoT or VR or blockchain that can help them uh, be innovative and go to the next level. So this is the stage that Serbia is in the moment. We're not thinking about basic digital transformation for digital services, but we are thinking about next level, which is automation in the government. Thank you. We have we don't have a lot of time, so do to Dragos. Uh... I will be brief in just one two sentences. So uh, coming back to the question, yes, of course, uh, digital objectives should be set from local to national level and from national level to local. Uh, basically, it should be a common uh, work. Uh, also from a combination of the private and public sector. Um, coming to, to the uh, topics which uh, were mentioned earlier uh, by, by our colleague, yes, we have a similar structure. We as an authority uh, represent a uh, main point in order to help other institutions or uh, public um, sectors to evolve from a digital point of view. Uh, but uh, those objectives and strategies are usually set also by that specific institution itself. We are helping in national programs or in di different directions, but we cannot do everything. Basically, the objectives should be set by... And uh, uh, one minute to answer uh, Corina's question about uh, strategic planning that also uh, of ministries that also relates to technology. Those comes comes together with the objectives. This was the, the, the last sentence which I wanted to highlight from, from a strategic planning itself, yes. Uh, different ministries have their own target or different targets also uh, based on funding. And we as an authority of uh, digitalization of Romania help in each way we can. One final remark, please. Yes, Olga. Um, yeah, to, to build on what was said before, um, I will bring a bit the humanities perspective in this discussion about technology. And... Um, I wanted to say that I've worked as a community organizer for many years, and of course, it's ideal to have the framework uh, for things to happen in co community and people adopt different solutions. But it's also very important to have the drive and the champions in, in communities that uh, can promote the solutions. Um, and I think it's it's important to to look at ways in which the public administration can go deep into the communities and understand the challenges and the dynamics and identify those champions who can promote uh, these digital solutions. 
And I think the most important lessons, lesson I've learned in the past 14 years since I've been involved in this work is that if you really want to increase the digital literacy of a community, teach the children, because the children will teach their parents, will teach their te teachers, and you will have this effect that will um, um, enable the entire community to become uh, digitally literate. But this is a process, and I think it's also a key to, in the way we can marry um, uh, the framework, the legal framework, with an approach at grassroots that will actually lead to a um, highly digitalized society. Uh, speaking of children, I remember uh, two, three years ago, I think the beginning of the pandemic, I was uh, using UiPath Academy, and uh, one of my kids came and said, Daddy, why are you doing school again? Why are you at school again? You're old. Um, she used the word old. Uh, I stress that. Um, and I think uh, this is a great example of a solution that is free, basically, and that can help others uh, achieve that. I want to really, really uh, uh, thank uh, the, the panelists and, and Marta for joining us, um, um, but also for this uh, great conversation that actually led to a, a global conversation from Serbia to, to some extent Germany, but also many countries in, in Africa. Um, and I want to extend my personal thanks to my, my colleagues, uh, Kodrin, who has done an amazing job organizing this event, and Alexandra, who's uh, somewhere, um, that uh, has been coordinating and, and putting a lot of effort in the report. You can uh, use these recycled and recyclable paper uh, QR code to check the report. Uh, it's about 48 pages of, uh, I'd say, top-notch quality. And I want to thank all the people that contributed to that, and especially our friends from UiPath and Margareta here, uh, for um, trusting, uh, as I think Dennis said, um, sometimes you need to go really crazy to achieve uh, uh, stuff. I would end with uh, an invitation to all of you, um, online and offline, uh, to revisit um, your ambitions. Um, we do talk a lot um, these days about changing the world. Uh, if we have small ambitions, we will achieve small objectives. If we have large and crazy ambitions, we might achieve at least medium objectives. Uh, on that note, uh, I wish you all a, a great uh, afternoon, uh, evening, actually. Um, and uh, thanks a lot to the tech team for helping us make this uh, possible, uh, and to our social innovation solutions team for making this possible. Thanks a lot. Have a great evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.